Well, welcome, Grace. We're glad you're here. Uh, well, not here, here, but wherever you are, we're excited to be able to worship with you. You know, the word church in Greek is the word ekklesia. It means a gathering together. And it's a sweet thing when we get to gather together on Sundays and then go back out into the world and carry out the mission of Jesus. While we can't gather together today for logistical reasons tied to the COVID-19 virus, we can gather together and encourage one another in the faith to worship our God together and to hear God's word. So that's what we're going to do. We're glad you're here with us. make this our prayer as we call out to God for his help, his strength. Oh, my soul longs for you. Oh, my soul
National Day of Prayer, uh, let us all be in a spirit of prayer if we could. God's word is provided to his servant David from Psalms. O Most High, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I am not afraid. What can flesh do to me? You have kept count of my blessings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your record? This I know that God is for me. In God whose word I praise, in the Lord whose word I praise, in God I trust, I am not afraid. My vows to you I must perform, O God. I will render thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death and my feet from failing so that I may walk before God in the light of life. I thank you, Lord, for all the resources and all the people of faith that have come and assembled and united their hearts as our congregation is this morning in faith. Um, I take inspiration, Lord, from these uh, remarkable words uh, from... Uh, a ministry that my wife uh, is have been so committed to in moms in prayer. And I just thank you, Lord, for other people of faith that are on their knees and in houses of worship this morning and in their homes, lifting up the name of God. God, the source of hope, will fill this congregation with joy and peace because we trust in you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we will overflow with hope and confidence. Shine your light in darkness. Remove the fear and panic. We pray, Lord, that you would equip the believers to be servants of love, grace, and mercy, and that all hearts would turn to you, Lord. We take comfort in knowing the truth replaces lies, trust replaces doubt, Truth and grace replace fear. Give provision for every need, Lord, that's out there, and we know there are many. Grant healing to those who are sick and help and support for their families. Watch out and care for our students, our faculty and staff, as many, many schools are closing. Grant wisdom to business leaders who make decisions how to respond to not only their customers, but protecting their employees. And grant wisdom, strength, and protection for these skilled and compassionate medical professionals who are seeking to help the sick. We pray, Lord, your special wisdom and discernment for the leaders of our country, our president, our vice president, governor, leaders of all institutions. We pray also, Lord, that you would bless our church and, uh, and uh, bless our pastors, staff, and our flock and reveal to us, Lord, how we might respond as men, women, and children of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 9, and the message paraphrase says, The revelation of God is whole and pulls all our lives together. And the signposts of God are clear and point out the right road. And the life maps of God are right, showing the way to joy. Now this morning our prayer is that this gathering, this time of pointing our hearts to God through song, prayer, and God's word would, would be a roadmap for us, would lead us to a destination, a destination of joy. Um, that's uh, what God wants to bring uh, into us, into our hearts as we 
connect with him. So I know you might be in a seated somewhere, a kitchen table, or maybe relaxing on your couch or somewhere watching this now. But if you're able and you want to stand with us, it might be kind of fun. You know, if we just kind of all stood and, and we sang together uh, these songs of, of hope and praise to a God who's worthy, who deserves it all. So let's do that. Let's stand together as we celebrate God. Joey's going to lead us in this song, thanking God for his amazing grace. He's a rescuer, he's a rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound, oh, how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord our rescuer. There is good news for the captive, good news for the shame. Praise the Lord. Hey. 
from Psalm 51, and today's verses are 5 through 7. For I was born a sinner, yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sin, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let's bring this God of grace and forgiveness, our confession, just the honesty of our heart today, our humanity, our brokenness. Let's bring it to the great physician, the healer, ask him for his mercy and his grace again today. As I read the verse once more, I invite you to kind of whisper these prayers, these words in your own way. For I was born a sinner. Yes, from the moment my mother conceived me. But you desire honesty from the womb, teaching me wisdom even there. Purify me from my sins, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. God's assurance of pardon, his promise to forgive is so beautifully said in those last few lines. Purify me from my sin, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. He is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all righteousness. You know, this Tuesday is St. Patrick's Day, right around the corner, and there's a prayer of St. Patrick that is one of encouragement and hope. It comes from this place of being forgiven, of being made right with God, and receiving His strength. And so Rachel's going to lead a few portions of this prayer for us this morning. I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Let's sing together. Be thou my vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be uphold me, God's wisdom to guide me, God's eye to look before me, God's ear to hear me, God's word to speak for me, God's hand to guard me, and God's shield to protect me. Let's sing together. Riches I heed not, nor men's empty prayer.
the prayer, I invite us all to kind of read together. And we'll take some turns. We'll do a little side one, side two. So wherever you are, you might want to kind of nudge your neighbor and pick a side, one or two, and we'll read responsively together this prayer. This side of the platform will kind of read. I'll read side one with you guys, and side two over here. We'll give it a shot. Uh, side one starts out with the regular words. You'll see them on the screen. You can look really close if you can't see it too well. The other line is green and italicized. Yes, so you, so side two follow the green italicized parts, okay? Side one, let's start it off. Here we go. Christ with me. Christ before me. Christ behind me. Christ in me. Christ beneath me. Christ above me. Christ on my right. Christ on my left. Christ when I lie down. Christ when I sit down. Christ when I arise. Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me. Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me. Christ in every eye that sees me. Christ in every ear that hears me. And all together we say, I arise today through a mighty strength, the invocation of the Trinity, through belief in the threeness, through confession of the oneness of the creator of creation. Well, let's sing out this last verse, Be Thou My Vision. High King of Heaven, when victory's won, may I reach Heaven's joys, go bright Heaven's sun. Heart of thy own heart, You know, usually at this time we greet one another. So maybe you might want to send a little comment to us on the webpage. Say hello on Facebook Live or wherever you're watching us. Uh, maybe make a new friend online in this uh, few moments now as Tim comes up to share. Thanks, Justin. Well, hello and uh, welcome to everyone who's here with us uh, today in the sanctuary and especially to you who are at home watching on Facebook Live. I know this has been a disorienting time uh, for all of us. Our lives have been disrupted in many ways. It's created a lot of challenges, and we just want you to know that we are here for you. I would direct you to our uh, website, the homepage, gracecealbeach.org. On that homepage, you'll see a, a button right in the middle where you can submit a prayer request, and then there's a banner at the top where you can get uh, current updates on what's happening in the life of the church and how we're doing things during this unique time. If you'd like a visit from one of the leaders of the church, or if you're at risk and you would like help grocery shopping or getting medication, we would love to help you. Just call the church office and we will be on that right away. Finally, if uh, you didn't receive uh, an email from Pastor Bob this last week updating you on the coronavirus and all the precautions our church is taking and how ministry continues to happen, go ahead and call the church office and let us know and we'd be glad to add you to that list. Usually at this point in the service, uh, we ask the ushers to come forward and receive the morning offering, uh, but we're not going to do that today. Instead, we'd like you to know that Grace has a caring fund, uh, which was established to help those experiencing urgent financial needs. And so if that's you, please let us know, myself or Pastor Bob, or call the church office, and we would love to respond and get that process going right away. We have a great need to pray during this time, don't we? But thankfully, we have an even greater God to whom we pray. And so I'd like to ask you uh, once again to bow and pray with me. Father, in the midst of this global crisis, we tend to feel small and helpless, as if there's nothing we can do, but there is something we can do. We can call out to you, 
our Father in heaven. We pray for the authorities running our countries and cities that you would give them wisdom and boldness to act. We pray for the medical teams treating the sick that you would protect them even as they help those in need. We pray for the men, women, and children who have been affected by this, infected by this virus, for those who are afraid to leave their homes, for those living in red zones, for those who are at high risk due to other illnesses, and for the elderly. This world needs your care and mercy at this time. Father, we pray as we often do that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We ask you now for your blessings upon us, your people, and upon all whom you have created. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, this is the time in our service where we, we thank God for his blessings and we, we want to respond to him. And, and so it's a time of celebration, a time of thinking how we can be a blessing to others out of the abundance that God's given us. Maybe ways you can help uh, your neighbors, the world around us, and, and a time to celebrate God. And so maybe think of something that you're thankful for. You know, just in this moment right now, you might want to just think of some things you're thankful for and just tell God how thankful you are. And as we sing, and this is a prayer, I uh, invite you again, maybe we stand together. So, you know, if, you're, if that was comfortable for you, give it another shot around your home, wherever you are, we're going to stand together. And out of thankfulness, make this prayer to a God who's with us, who's powerful enough to meet every need. Well, come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wine.
acclaimed and read and as we prepare our hearts to receive what God would want to say to us today, I invite you to pray this prayer uh, with us, and you'll see it on the screen. Let's try it together. We pray, Lord, that you will open the door of our hearts to receive your word and be changed by the power of your Holy Spirit. This morning's scripture reading is from Matthew 10, 26 to 33. So then, have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body and cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Well, thanks for the chance to get to worship together in so many different places this morning. The church is a special people, even if we can't be together in the same place. Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 10, so if you have a Bible on your shelf there at home, feel free to pull it out or pull it up on your phone um, if you can do that without turning off the Facebook Live and uh, follow along as we go through this together. I was talking to a couple of our leaders this week and a couple of our elders about how this is really an unprecedented ministry experience for us. Uh, As far as I know, as far as any of us could find out in the 76-year history of our church, we've never held worships, we've never canceled holding worship services. This is a new thing for us. So I'm really grateful for the technology that lets us be able to do this remotely. Talking to some of the leaders, we couldn't really even remember another time that there was something that felt like this. You know, with 9-11, or I grew up in Northern California, we had the 1989 earthquake. They tended to be major events, traumatic events, but they happened, and then we sort of picked up the pieces afterwards. This feels more like a hurricane or a tornado where we're waiting for the worst to happen. And in the midst of those waiting times, a lot of fear can come to the surface, can't it? And we've seen it all throughout uh, our community this week. We've seen the fear and the panic that comes up with people feeling like there's not going to be enough for them. And so people have flocked to Ralph's and Trader Joe's and CVS to get the last of the toilet paper, the last of the food. And beneath that is a fear that we will be left in want, that no one will take care of our needs at the end. Some of us are having a lot of fear about what if we cough on someone and get them sick? What if we're fine, but we transmit the virus to someone and they die? We've put on other people's mortality onto our own shoulders, and we wear the weight of that fear in our lives. Some of us have a lot of fears about our job or about the economy crashing. We're scared that our business might go under as a result of this, or our restaurant might close, that the thing that Uh, is our livelihood might go away and might not be there at the end of this pandemic. Some of us have fears over being blamed uh, from racist people that it's our fault because of the color of our skin, our ethnic background, that we're the ones who are responsible for this. Some of us have a fear of fear itself. We're afraid of other people's fears, or we're afraid of what panic might induce in other people's lives. Or we've decided that we're unwilling to be afraid. We're we're afraid of being afraid ourselves. And so we've acted flippantly or foolishly towards other people. And not an insignificant number of us are afraid of the virus. We're afraid of our own mortality and our own death. We're afraid of catching it. And we're afraid of what it might mean and whether there'll be medical care for us. We are in a week and a month of fear. So in our passage today, in Matthew 10, we're going to look at how Jesus prepared his disciples for a time of deep fear. 
In Matthew 10, Jesus has sent out the 12 disciples, and he is commissioning them and briefing them for what to expect. And he says, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. Can you imagine what a fearful situation, what a fearful metaphor that is, to be a sheep among a pack of wolves, to see your life flash before your eyes. And Jesus says, I'm going to help prepare you for how to respond and to find hope in a time of fear. Now, in this passage, Jesus is, the context is a little different because Jesus is helping the disciples prepare for how they're going to respond to proclaiming the gospel and the fear that might come with the rejection of people. And even, ultimately, for 11 of the disciples, uh, or for 10 of the 11 disciples, that lost their life as a result of that. They have good reason to be afraid. For us, that's not the fear that's in this moment. It's a different situation. But the response is the same of how we deal with fear. As, and Jesus' prescription is the same for us as it is for the original disciples. How do we respond in moments of fear? Let's get into it in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny, Jesus says, and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs on your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, for you are of more value than sparrows. Here's really what I want you to hear, that you are seen and cared for by God. You are seen and cared for by God. Even as sparrows are seen and cared for by God, you are of so much more value to him than they are. And your fear needs to be held in the arms of a loving father in heaven who cares for you and sees you. And what you believe about God is being tested this week. What you believe about how he sees you and how he cares for you is being put to a significant test in the time of fear. Have you ever tried to count sparrows, by the way? The passage says that Jesus see, in this passage, Jesus says that the Father sees and knows every sparrow. Have you ever tried to count birds as they float about? Or have you ever tried to tell them apart? A sparrow is a sparrow. Who knows? Who cares how many, people, how many sparrows there are? And sometimes we think that God sees us with that same sort of flippancy that we see the birds with. But Jesus says, no, no, I I know that my Father sees you and cares for you. Sparrows were a source of food in Jesus' day. In fact, they were food for the poorest people in the marketplaces. Because when you look at a sparrow, you see how small they are, how they're, they're basically just bones and feathers. There's almost nothing there of value, almost nothing there of worth to eat. Maybe a couple bites, but nothing really worth attending to. And Jesus says, if, if God cares for something that insignificant, how much more does he care for you? Often we think of ourselves like sparrows, that we're unknown, unnoticed, unknown, uncounted, and invaluable, that we don't really matter. And sometimes our fears come to the surface, especially in times like this. We don't have a job, maybe you don't have a job to go to this week, or you don't have a school to go to, or you don't have hobbies where you can show your value. You don't have ways to tell people, look at me, I'm doing something meaningful. And our fears of insignificance can come to the surface. But Jesus says, oh, just because you are made in God's image, and because you're a follower of me, the Father sees you and cares for you. Before you do anything to earn his approval or earn his attention, he sees you. So fear not. You are more valuable than sparrows. You are seen by God, and God is in control, even of situations that feel like they're out of control. Even when it seems like wolves are going to attack you and kill you, you are still in the Father's hands. Even when it seems like a virus has run rampant over our culture, country, and world, it is in the Father's hands. God is in control of the sparrows, and he's in charge of your life as well. Theologians call this the providence of God, to say that nothing happens out of the control of God's hand. In Colossians 1, Paul says that Christ holds all things together. What an important picture for us to be reminded of this morning. Christ holds all things together. Yes, the sparrow does fall. Right? The sparrow does die. And there are terrible things that are going to happen in the next year and the next however long we have to live. But Jesus tells his disciples, don't be afraid in those moments. For the Father sees you and he cares about you. 
So, in a time when we feel like we have so little control, how can we respond well to fear? How do we respond with hope in a time of fear? Well, the first thing we can control is we can control what we do with our anxieties. In 1 Peter 5, Peter says, Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. You and I have a choice in these moments of fear of what to do with our anxieties. We may not have a choice of whether to be afraid or not. Fear is a pretty automatic response, and fear is often driven by the situation. But we do have a choice of what to do with those anxieties. Do we, are we setting them on God? Or are we holding them and clutching them to ourselves? And specifically, are we setting our minds on God? Isaiah 26.3 says, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. I'm going to read that again because it's really important. You can control what you set your mind on. Isaiah 26.3, You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Is your mind set on God? Or are you so focused on the things that you're afraid of that God has been crowded out and pushed out of your mindset this week? After all, there's a lot of reasons to be afraid. We talked about some at the start of the message. There's a lot of stimulations towards fear that maybe weren't there a couple weeks ago, or at least they weren't on the surface. But the coronavirus has brought to the surface for a lot of us fears that were always there. And it's an opportunity for you and for me to reset our minds on God. Because ultimately, you are not in trouble. No, no matter what happens out of this, you are not in trouble, and the kingdom of God is not in trouble. Jesus tells his disciples here in verse 26 that based on their circumstances, they may think that they're in trouble. They may think that things are bad. But ultimately, if you're in Christ, everything that really matters for eternity is secure. You are not in trouble and the kingdom of God is not in trouble. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 26 that they are to not have any fear of the things that the world seems to make fearful. And this is his reason. He says, Nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light. And what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. What Jesus is saying is that, when the gospel is shouted out, when the gospel is known, when the gospel is proclaimed, it pushes away the need to fear. You and I need to remind ourselves of the gospel afresh this week. We need to be reminded of the fact that our life is hidden in Christ. That God has made us, he sees us, he cares for us. And even though we've rebelled against God, we've pushed him away, all of us have gone our own way, that Jesus nonetheless has come to die the death that we deserve. And that as a result of his death, the Father raised him to new life again, and that all who believe in him can have eternal life with God. And because we have that hope of eternal life, we follow Jesus today, knowing that our eternity is secure. We need to be reminded of the gospel. As the Heidelberg Catechism reminds us, what is your only comfort in life and death? that I am not my own, but I belong with body and soul, both in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and he has set me free from the power of the devil. As Justin Martyr, a, a second century theologian who ultimately would die for his faith, as Justin Martyr said, they may kill us, but they cannot hurt us. They may kill us, but they cannot hurt us. And if I can modify that for our situation this week, there may be real things to be afraid of, but they, can't, they cannot ultimately cause us harm that our Father has not secured and that the Son has not achieved. They may kill us, but they cannot hurt us. Jesus says something even more profound in verse 28 when he says, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the body and soul in hell. We have a lot of fears this week about our situation, but Jesus reminds us that the fears of the things of this world are small compared to the reverential and joyful fear we have towards God, the one who loves us, who sees us, who provides for us, and who we worship this morning. Well, what do I want for you? I want you to have peace. I don't want you to have fear. But I, I want it to be based 
on not the ups and downs of this world, but based on the hope that we have in Christ. You know, the last thing I'd want you to take away from this message or from this morning is to think that you should have peace because, you know, maybe the virus isn't that bad or you're young and you're healthy or, you know, we've been through flus before. I'm sure this will be fine. Or, you know, I've got plenty of toilet paper, so whatever. Um, I, I don't want you to find peace in the world's things. I want you to find peace in knowing that you're secure in Christ. As Jesus says in John 14, 27, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus gives us peace because our eternity is secure in him. He gives us peace because the Father cares for us. And because of that peace, he equips you and me to serve him for an eternity and to serve him in times of great fear. You know, you may have heard before about how Christians in the first couple centuries of the church were uniquely willing to serve those who were sick and dying. In the first couple centuries of the church, there was a, a, a big plague, and Christians were unique in their willingness to stay with people who were sick and dying and minister to them while their neighbors and even their family members left them on their own to die. And after the plague had passed, a lot of those people who had come back to health ultimately became Christians because they remembered who their neighbors were in the times of hardship. And because of that, many of them choose, chose to follow Jesus. What will our neighbors remember about us as a church after this is over? Once this plague has passed, what will our neighbors remember of how we responded to them? Do we respond with selfishness or with selflessness? Do we respond with fear or with love? Do we respond looking out for our own interests alone or towards the interests of others? We have a great reason to be hopeful. We have a great hope in the midst of our fear. And we have a great Savior who has given up his own security for our, for our benefit. And as we follow him, we do the same for others. I want to end with a, a quote from Martin Luther. Luther, in, uh, in the 16th century, after the Reformation had already started, uh, there was a bubonic plague that had taken its route through Germany. And if there was ever someone who could kind of be forgiven for thinking that he was too important to lose, it'd be Martin Luther, right? He had started the whole Protestant Reformation. And yet Luther and his wife, uh, Katie, decided that it was their Christian obligation and Christian duty to care for the sick, even at their own peril. Now, I know this is a previous age, and you might think, well, he didn't know about germs. Maybe he didn't think he could catch it. Luther actually wrote some really profound stuff about this that shows a really deep understanding of contagion, which was really thoughtful for his time. Uh, so he knew that he was at risk of dying by caring for these people. But Luther said uh, that it was his responsibility as a Christian and his obedience to Christ not to live out of fear, but in order to serve his neighbor. He said, no one should dare leave his neighbor unless there are those others who will take care of the sick in their stead and nurse them. We must respect the word of Christ. I was sick and you did not visit me. From Matthew 25. According to this passage, we're bound to each other in such a way that no one may forsake the other in distress but is obliged to assist and help him as he himself would like to be helped. Our church in the midst of this is going to help you as you need help. If you're watching this and you're uh, scared and you'd like someone to pray with, we'd like to pray with you. If you're watching this and you're scared of going to the store or you're scared of going to the grocery store or you need help getting medicine, we want to help you with that. If you're lonely and you're watching this, you feel like you don't have a group of friends, you feel like you're isolated, um, we want to practice social distancing, but we don't want to practice social isolation. We want to help you find community in this time. I believe our church and the Christian churches around our country and around the world can be at our best through this. We can show the love of Jesus in practical and profound ways and not choose to live out of fear, but live out of the hope that we have in Christ. Let's pray. God, I am grateful for that which you have whispered in the darkness. May we shout it in the light. And in the midst of the darkness of our age, may we remember what you have said in the light. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters who are um, in the medical profession and who are responding to this on a daily basis in hospitals and in ambulances. I pray that you would protect them as they are courageous in serving others. 
God, I pray for my friends who are parents who are trying to think about how to talk to their kids about this. May you give them words of hope rather than fear. God, I pray for my friends who are watching this who are in the at-risk groups, either because of immune disorders or because of their age or pre-existing conditions. God, we pray your protection over them. May we show our honor for our fathers and mothers in the faith by the way that we honor the elderly among us. God, I pray for those of us um, who are annoyed by this, who feel like we're being inconvenienced. May you use this to remove ourselves from the center of the world and put you, put you on the throne rather than our own preferences and desires. Jesus, I pray that we would follow you as people of hope rather than people of fear. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, in the few moments that we have left together, we want to provide an opportunity to, to respond to God. And the word that you've heard shared and proclaimed this morning, uh, give a chance for you to kind of bring that to God in your own personal way. You might want to close your eyes where you are. You might want to just kind of quiet your heart for a moment and just kind of ask God, where might he be leading you in this season? Who might he be nudging you to, to help or to be present for? All of this comes from the strength of God, not our own striving or our own effort. And so let's take this time to ask God for his strength. Let's depend on him. Let's rely on him. And before we sing this last song, take a moment and in your own way to, to ask God to lead you, strengthen you, that we could be a blessing to others. Thank you.
Well, if you'd like to pray with someone after the service, uh, on the Facebook Live, there are some comments there. Or there's a way that you can get in contact with us to pray, or you can email us at info at gracesealbeach.org. Or for the volunteers who are here, I'd be happy to stick out afterwards and pray with you as well. Our benediction today comes from Jude chapter 1. May you build up yourselves in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Amen.